Shalom, my friends. I hope you had a great week. And I have a very serious conversation today. Probably one of the most serious we will ever have. We're at Parsha's Shemot. It's an important Parsha. It begins our next book, our next Chumash, I should say, the book of Shemot. Shemot. And here we begin to see a development of the Jewish people. We are in Egypt. We are no longer the preferred people of Yaakov and Yosef. They're both gone. We're in slavery. Our children, our boys, are being thrown into the water. We're crying. We're begging Hashem for help. Husbands are leaving wives. In this particular case, it's Amram who leaves Yochevit, two Levites, their daughter Miriam says, but what are you doing? You're not only not having boys, but you're also not having girls. So basically what you're doing is you're destroying our people. So they get back together again. Moshe Rabbeinu is born. And here begins the story of Yochevet seeing that the child illuminates the home, that he is already circumcised at birth. And she realizes that this is an extraordinary child. She hides him for three months until she can't hide him anymore, puts him into a basket, and the story you all know. Moshe Rabbeinu gets picked up by Batya, the daughter of the Pharaoh, she gets nurse, he gets nursed by his mother. The schut, the privilege of Miriam to be able to fix this all up. Batya loves Moses. From the water she took him. There is an interesting thought that you have a, a child growing up in the environment of Golas, meaning Egypt, but the child remains attached to his people. And we see what happens when Moses goes out and he sees his people being hit and he kills the Egyptian, the story, the story is, is obviously easy to understand from the point of view of what happens how a leader is born, how we begin to 
evolve with Moshe Rabbeinu and how he begins to evolve with us and how Hashem takes him, how Hashem cures him, cures him not of his problem of speaking, which basically is why he doesn't want to accept Hashem's promotion of him being a leader for the Jewish people. But basically, here you have a humble shepherd who loves his flock, who runs after his sheep, realizes that the sheep only runs away because he wants to drink. But we have Hashem looking at this human being and saying, well, if you're that concerned about a sheep, how much more concerned will you be about my people who need a shepherd, who need guidance, who need a communicator between me, Hashem, you, the people, Pharaoh, the oppressor. You know, I always look at things in the way that the Rebbe says, live with the Parsha of the week. And here is the week, the day after the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States, someone who never, ever, a year ago thought ever to be elected, someone who, by the populist standard of what we would call being revered and admired and loved by the people, um, and because of that, has won the election, not so with Donald Trump. Not so with Donald Trump, for sure, and the people automatically are absolutely not being treated well after Moses goes to Pharaoh. As a matter of fact, their problems increase. And I'm looking at this election, and I'm looking at this inauguration, and I'm looking at the fact that there was a very well-known Rav present, Rabbi Heyer, who Anybody who knows the Wiesenthal Center is familiar with Rabbi Heyer, with his work, with his real devotion to the Jewish people, and in running the center and creating the center, the never again of the destruction of the Jewish people is being promoted again. His being at the inauguration, of course, immediately anti-Semitic movement, anti-Semitic threats, he's being looked at even by Jews, of course by Jews, as not appropriate to have been there first time that a rabbi was at the inauguration actually inaugurating a president of the United States, unless I'm mistaken, 
I know that President Reagan, the second time he was elected, had a rabbi present. But this is definitely Yotze Dofen. This is definitely something that wasn't ever, has never been. However, in the times that we live in, and in the times of Shemot, we have again a leader rising. A leader who says, I will bring the Israeli embassy back to where it actually belongs, which is Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. This, if nothing else, if nothing else, <laughs> this is almost a declaration of war. Two weeks ago, we talked about the United Nations Security Council demolishing Israel. And the following week, the Pope giving an embassy to the Palestinians, if you take a look at what's going on in Italy, earthquakes, avalanches, unbelievable weather. Nobody puts anything together, but the Zohar puts things together. So, by the end of the Parsha, we have a people who says, what do we need this for? I mean, since you came on the scene, we're in trouble and we're getting, besides being massacred and having our children massacred, besides being slaves, besides having a miserable life now because of what you did, it's even worse. Now we have to make bricks without straw and the people complain. It's all there, it's all understandable, it's all today. And ultimately, if you take away all the trappings of everything that is exterior in our world, you'll come to exactly the same moment. So far, the story. I'm going to go into Shemot in the Sonchino Zohar and I'm going to say what I say each and every time. Because if you are studying Zohar, and if you are listening to our time together, our conversations, you will not walk away elevated. You will not walk away with a great feeling, oh, wow. You know, this is just what I needed for the day, for the week. You will walk away with knowledge that you never had before. And this I can almost promise you. Because nobody talks about these things. You will not hear a lecture about which three types of men drive away the Shekhinah 
but you will hear it now. And I invite you to think about it. And I invite you to understand why our world is the way our world is. And why our Jewish world is the way it is. Our enemies on the outside are great. Our enemies within are greater. Have always been. And I'm prefacing this part of the Zohar really as the cause of the downfall of our people, of our exiles, of our destruction of our temples, and the fact that Mashiach has not yet come. In this Parsha in the Zohar, Mashiach exists, is outlined, the timing is outlined, where he comes from, what are his necessities, what is his nature, how will he be, what is the timing? Everything is outlined. We can't go into it. We don't have enough time. I don't think under any circumstances any one of us is ready to really understand that. But I am going to bring out this point because as far as I am concerned, it is the root cause of our generations, of why this generation is the generation of Mashiach, why this generation is at the 49th level of abomination and why the doors of Shemayim must open, they must open because we just simply cannot remain the way we are, we cannot remain in the situation that we're in and we cannot turn ourselves away from the truth it's very easy to say, I don't believe in God. There is no God. Science has proved that there is no God. The abominations of the world, the horrors of the world can't possibly be God because God is merciful and God is kind. And in od milvado, there is no other beside him. And the God of mercy and the God of kindness would never, ever allow anything like this to happen. The pogroms, the destructions, the expulsions, the inquisitions, the holocaust, the murder, the antifada, you just cannot understand, we cannot understand how this God that we pray to can allow such things to happen. And on the other side, there is another conversation. You think of what you're doing in your life. That you deserve 
what you're asking for. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to be bad. I am of the absolute conviction that everybody is good. And that what is not good, what is not good, comes from the outside, doesn't come from our neshamas, doesn't come from our souls. But our sins that I will now outline and afterwards I will not say any more than what I have already said and I'm asking you to please consider your own lives, the lives of your families, the lives of your children, the lives of our people, the history of our people, and look at things clearly and objectively because what I'm going to put in front of you is going to give you the answers to an enormous amount of questions and you're not going to like it and it's going to make you think I hope it will make you think and I hope it will make changes, though history has proven not so. There's one other thing I need to say, because this peace in the Zohar is very difficult to take. When you have questions about your life, when you have questions about your family, when you have questions about where and why do things happen, Don't turn around and take the easy way out. We all do it. We all look for the easy way out. Delve into study. Delve into learning. Understand. Before you form an opinion, be informed. And then use your mind and discern carefully. I have had a very, very difficult life. And I have made incredible mistakes and gone through great pain in my life. very close to the edge, very close to taking my own life, very close to death's door a number of times. But that was, that isn't anymore for a long time. Because once I began to study, all of the questions that I've had all of my life began to become as clear as anything can be. Shemot 3a b the third book of the Solchino Zohar 
page 7. There are three types of men who drive away the Shekhinah from the world, make it, it, making it impossible for the Holy One, blessed be He, to fix His abode in the universe and causing prayers to be unanswered. One type is he who cohabits with a woman in the days of her separation. There is no impurity comparable to this. He defiles himself and all connected with him. The child born of such a union is shapen in impurity, imbibes the spirit of impurity, and its whole life is founded on impurity. Next is he who lies with a heathen woman, for he profanes herewith the sacred sign of the covenant, which constitute the support of the sacred name and the essence of faith. As soon as the people committed whoredom with the daughters of Moab, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The leaders of the people who did not endeavor to prevent them were the first to be punished. And in every generation, it is the leaders who are made responsible for all the members of the community in regard to the prophet profanation of the sign of the covenant, which is sun and shield. As the sun gives light to the world, so does the holy sign give light to the body. And as the shield protects, so does the holy sign protect. He who keeps it in impurity is guarded from evil. He who keeps it in purity is guarded from evil. And a third time I say it. He who keeps it in purity is guarded from evil. But he who transfers this sign of holiness into a strange domain, breaks the commandment, thou shalt not have other gods but me. For to deny the king's seal is equivalent to denying the king himself. Next is he who purposely prevents the seed from coming to fruition. For he destroys the king's workmanship and so causes the Holy One to depart from the world. This sin is the cause of war, famine, and pestilence. And it prevents the Shekhinah from finding any resting place in the world for these abominations. The spirit of holiness weeps. Woe to him who causes this. It were better that he had never been born. It was counted to the Israelites for righteousness that... Although in exile in Egypt, they kept themselves free from these sins and moreover fearlessly filled the command to increase and multiply. 
This made them worthy to be liberated. Rabbi Chia found an indication of the purity of the Israelitish woman in Egypt in the text, and he made the lever of brass and the foot of it brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling at the door of the tent. What was the merit of the women to have made them worthy of such honor that their looking glasses should be used for the lever of the tabernacle? Their ritual ablutions on one hand and their eagerness to attract their husbands on the other. I know you understand this. And as difficult as Kabbalah is made out to be, and I think probably the greatest difficulty of Kabbalah is that it tells us things in the way that are so true and so honest and so powerful that we don't want to hear it. Obviously, here is the reason why our people are in the situation that we're in. And if you re-listen to this after the first time, a second time, and maybe a third time, all the words will become very, very clear. And you will see why this Parsha is a, a guideline for our lives and our future. I wish you a beautiful week. Be healthy. Be happy. Shavuot Tov.